All right, so this first case is a lady with lung cancer. And uh, this is a CT from two years ago. You can see some ground glass in the left upper lobe and then this solid uh, nodule. This was resected along with the entire left upper lobe and came back as adenocarcinoma. Um, you can see she's a smoker with some emphysema. And the more you look, the more you start seeing there's little ground glass kind of nodules everywhere. Um, <clears throat> the findings that are interesting and, and related to later on include this uh, cystic bubbly thing back here. Um, and then this little tiny nodule right here uh, involving the, the right upper lobe, this the central nodule. Um, so this was a, a PET done around that time showing a, a little bit of uptake in that uh, larger left upper lobe uh, nodule. And then she came back, uh, she had multiple follow-ups, but then about two years later, uh, she came back and you can see there's a, a little bit more solid component associated with the cystic thing in the posterior right upper lobe. And then that uh, more central nodule has really kind of blossomed in size um, and grown quite a bit. Um, and uh, uh, she, she'd she already had a left upper lobectomy at that point. Um, so she went for a repeat PET, um, which showed uh, that despite being relatively small, that a uh, central nodule was very, very uh, hot. Um, and the posterior right upper lobe thing was was not particularly. So, I'd, so um, uh, at, at first, uh, they asked me for a biopsy, and I said, oh, gosh, that's going to be, uh, that's very central, very, it's going to be hard to get to. Um, and I was hopeful maybe this is a, just a lymph node, and maybe we can sample this. Um, however, when she, when she lay prone, um, the, this kind of solid component, this is probably mostly just atelectasis, and it went away, and so this is probably just some scarring and emphysema. So I um, did a biopsy of it, and uh, anyone want to care to guess what this came back as? Was it Coxie? No, <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, no, no, no. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's just bread and butter. Uh, th this is a, a small cell carcinoma. Um, small so, cell. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was interesting that it was it was there two years ago, relatively small, and then uh, it grew. And even even in just the, I think from this CT to this biopsy, um, it, it it grew by like forty percent in size. Um, just in like a month and a half. Um, so yeah. Can you show your biopsy? I mean, that's impressive. I, the kudos to you for, for for getting that. How did you? What was your approach? So you just came pretty deep right through there. I see. Yeah. So she uh, she fell asleep um, halfway through. So uh, unfortunately, I had to pop out a plane and hit a small pulmonary artery on the way in. Um, uh, there's a pulmonary vein on the way back, but uh, um, let's see. There there is a there is a window. Um, had a skirt by the little emphysematous bulla there. Um, you can see where I popped out of the plane there. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just 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 kind of straight straight back. There's a pulmonary artery branch here and here. Um, so just tried to stay um, fairly straight uh, away from those. Uh -huh. And then you can see that that's I probably had a, an artery uh, out of plane there. Um, and then yeah, then right into it. Impressive. Yeah, it was nice. So the small cell had been there. It makes you wonder if maybe, I mean, because small cell grows so fast, I would have a hard time. You said it had been there for how long? Or at least like, uh, this initial CT was two years ago. Makes you wonder if that was really, if that was something else, or maybe it was a carcinoma. I don't know if carcinoma is even, I never heard of one degenerating into a small cell, but maybe a neuroendocrine something that blew up. Yeah. Yeah, like an atypical carcinoid. Yeah. You know, guys, there was an article a few uh, decades ago about how often um, cell types in lung cancers are mixed. If you just have a, you know, you have a small specimen, you may get an adenocarcinoma from part of it. You may get, you know, a uh, uh, epithelial carcinoma on, in another part of it, a squamous. And you can even get small cell mixed in with that. So it's not surprising to me that you have a heterogeneous lung cancer in some cases. I think that she probably had an adenocarcinoma as the cause of that bubbly lesion, and she also then she developed a small cell component within it or something like that, and then that rapidly grew. That's what you got on the biopsy, but you know chances are she she might well have had both. You know it really looks like an adenocarcinoma, bubbly BAC as we used to call them. To yeah, with. no, that was my hope was to 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 uh, kind of get off easy and and biopsy the 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 more cystic thing posteriorly but uh yeah when she lay 
prone, the solid part uh, kind of diminished. It didn't go away completely, but it was it was it was it was much smaller than it, than uh, it had been when she was laying supine. So here's here's a here's a, 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 a the prone image from the biopsy, uh, one millimeter cut, and you can see uh, there's a little bit of solid stuff there, but it's it's not a whole lot different than than this one from two years prior. Um, and so I think yeah, I think. Uh, that was my hope initially, but uh, and I was basing that off of, off of this solid part right here. But uh, my my hopes were dashed. Cool case. And so we've not we've not resected this lesion though, right? No, she's uh she so yeah she already had the left upper lobectomy and then she had radiation for another tumor. I forgot the what the histology of that was in the right uh right middle lobe and right lower uh, and the hit the the radiation hit the right lower lobe also. So uh, I don't think she's a candidate. Uh, uh, for for resection. Well, if it's small cell, I think chemo rads is perfectly acceptable. It looks as if there's another lesion centrally there that you scroll by near the right hilum. <clears throat> yeah. Hey Brian, I joined late. I had one question: <clears throat> Was sure. she treated with immunotherapy for any of these other cancers, or I, I missed uh, history? Not as far as I'm aware. I think uh, it was a uh, radiation for for whatever was down here. I think it was this guy. Um, I'm not sure if there was a, a, a immunotherapy at that time. Yeah, because well, because we are seeing increasing rates of, rates of small cell transformation as as a resistance mechanism, like especially with osimertinib. I think we've seen it with Pembro as well. So, oh, interesting. Wait, so Travis, you're seeing um, like proven adenocarcinomas that then start growing again and they get re-biopsied and it's showing small cell? Correct. After So patients that will respond on OC or another immunotherapy, and then we've been biopsying a lot of them when there's recurrence because there we've had, I don't know, more than a handful of cases every year that turn out to be small cell transformation. That's one of the big things they're worried about now. Oh, that seems to me. I will have to look into that. I wonder if it's transformation or whether it's survival of a clone or something like that, you know. Right. <clears throat> Very and interesting. How, and how far out are these transformations happening? Are they happening like shortly after therapy or like year or two out? Uh, months to years. I don't have a good time frame for okay. you. Let me see what I can pull up while. Um, is it okay if I show another one? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so this next one uh, is uh, a cardiac case. Uh, this is a 14-year-old uh, uh, young man who was uh, physically assaulted, um, and he came in with this chest CT initially. Um, and uh, let me just make sure. Um, Yes, uh, and uh, interestingly, the the CT didn't show any displaced fractures. Um, he, uh, in terms of the trauma, it sounds like he was. Uh, there were multiple people attacking him. He had a, a skateboard uh, hit over his chest at one point. Um, you know, the, there's non-fused sternal centers, um, but you know, nothing that looks like a fracture necessarily. Um, his troponins were, uh, you can see that he's got quite a bit of, of uh, consolidation, it's dependent. Um, his troponins were through the roof. Um, this was read out as, as probable pulmonary edema. Um, uh, and he uh, underwent a cardiac MRI uh, three days later. Um, and uh, this is the T2 stir image. Um, I'm not sure if this is artifact or real, but this is the um, anteromedial papillary muscle. Um, uh, and it's a little edematous, um, but otherwise uh, normal stir signal there. And then what's interesting is that there's a lot of enhancement involving the lateral wall of the left ventricle. So this is the, the mag sequence. And uh, this is all enhancement here. This part's spared. Then this is enhancement here as well. Um, there's a little bit involving the septal um, at the apex. And then here's on the short axis, again, kind of this this patchy, um, non-ischemic pattern of enhancement involving the the lateral wall, um, which was odd since uh, you know he was presumably assaulted um, by things hitting him in the sternum um, and chest anteriorly. Um, this was an unusual appearance that I hadn't seen before, uh, uh, and so I uh, I initially said you know like I. I'd be worried about this being some kind of myocarditis. Um, and then one of my colleagues showed me this paper. 
um, from uh, JCMR looking at a uh, cardiac MRI findings of blunt cardiac injury. And you can see uh, in, in this case um, that the lateral wall is often involved. And they hypothesized in this paper that uh, it's related to these, these kind of stress patterns um, where uh, uh, there's a shear strain on the lateral wall when there's a compression of the ventricle. Um, and then um, it results in uh, 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 myocardial injury in those areas. So, wow. uh, there's uh, very, very few cases of this that are reported. There's like maybe five cases uh, in the English language literature. So I, I said, you know, this could be blunt cardiac injury, but make sure it's not myocarditis um, as well. Skateboard it looks like a Yeah, it looks like a contra coup injury. Yeah. Um, so, oh, and the, the other funny thing about this, uh, he, and they did extensive genetic testing on him, um, and it came back positive for ARVD. So he might, um, some, some sort of precursor, perhaps you can see his RV is, is enlarged, um, which would be the only task force criteria that he met. Um, so perhaps, perhaps, uh, that predisposed him to having, um, a more severe myocardial injury. Um, last case, um, I... Hopefully, I'm the only one who's been seeing this. Uh, so this is a young man who had a COVID vaccine uh, recently, um, uh, and he came in with a, acute chest pain that woke him up from night. You can see he's got a, a, a coronary variant, a uh, benign one with uh, where there's no left main. Uh, the LED and the LCX arise di uh, directly from the, the, the left coronary cusp. I don't know if this was a little bit of an overcall, but I thought on the, the short axis reconstruction from the CT, there might have been a little bit of hyperemia involving the lateral wall there. It could also just be edge artifact. Um, he went to cardiac MRI uh, three days later. Um, you can see on the stir sequences, there is uh, abnormal increased signal involving the lateral wall of the left ventricle. Um, it's uh, maybe a little bit involving the, the anterior wall as well. Um, and then there's delayed uh, enhancement involving the, the mid myocardium and subepicardial um, predominantly at the base, and then um, also uh, uh, involving the, the lateral wall at the apex as well. And here's uh, what that looks like on the four chamber. Um, so we've now seen two cases uh, with this story, um, and there's a, I, I, don't, I don't have it pulled up, but there's an uh, article from the lay literature in, uh, out of Israel that, that's, that's finding a, a couple coincidences of, of myocarditis associated with uh, uh, vaccine uh, administration seems to be related to the Pfizer vaccine. I, I, I don't think, I, I think it's still too early to tell whether it's correlation or causation. I, you know, the, the, it's, it's also enterovirus season here. So, um, and most of the time when we have myocarditis, we, we never find a causative agent anyway. Um, so, but anyway. Uh, something to keep an eye out for. Yeah, Brian, I, sh I, I showed one recently. We've had, I think, two here. Same kind of 19-year-old, like five days after second dose. I, I can't remember if it was Pfizer or Moderna, but it was an mRNA vaccine. I wonder if it's if it's more like the similar, I mean, because remember there's been case reports and there's those couple series and athletes of patients who had COVID who developed a myocarditis as well that seemed uh, like we did in our athletes here. I think we only had two cases and there was that paper out of uh, Ohio state that I think had a higher rate, but I think they had um, symptomatic patients, whereas we just treated all the athletes who had COVID. Um, and so it was like a very small number, it was like 1.5%. But I wonder if it's maybe an immune, uh, maybe some kind of cross immunity reaction because the, the mRNA vaccines, of course, are generating the spike proteins and, and that seems to be the target for uh, uh, the adaptive immunity. So I wonder if if it's not truly direct infection, but rather the host immune response causing a transient myocarditis. It could be. I just hope not. <laughs> yeah. So it seems to be a very so the, rare occurrence. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of comments. One, I think the the athlete covid myocarditis thing has been debunked there was i i questioned some of that early literature and there was a more recent paper in jack that was a much larger population and they found like no statistical significance um and now the vaccine pediatrics they i just got an email about it from doximity i think this morning that there's a pediatrics uh, preprint talking about pfizer and um, myocarditis in, in pfizer vaccinated kids 
but I don't know. The original images from that, I think it was Ohio State or, or Penn State, one of those. Those were even suspect cardiac MR images if you guys looked at that paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our, our series from UW, I think that my colleagues did, it was like, I think of the however many hundreds of athletes they screened, they found one with a subtle area and one that actually had real myocarditis, but whether it's related or not is unclear. Yeah, I mean, anecdotally, I don't think we're seeing more myocarditis uh, during June 2021 than we did during June 2019 or June 2020. So I, I, I don't know. No. Interesting. Well, thank you, Brian. Thank you. Travis or David? I've got a couple, Jeff. All right. <clears throat> So here is a radiograph that uh, looks pretty normal to me in um, a middle-aged guy. And here is a subsequent radiograph on the, on the same person. And now there is a bulge down here in the anterior cardiophrenic angle. And on lateral view, you can see that it's anterior here. It seems to have a partly sharp margin here. And then we don't see a very good margin up here. But this... Um, this came up in the course of uh, a year or two. It wasn't there before. So um, CT is the way to go on these things. And it turns out to be a, um, a fatty mass that is shown up all at once, nice and fat filled. And um, if we look at it on coronal, we'll find out what's going on here. Um, you can see that there's a break in the <clears throat> anterior diaphragm and this is herniated omental fat. So it was a dramatic change in serial radiographs on this person who's being screened every couple of years for occupational exposures to bad things like asbestos and uh, beryllium. So uh, here's a, you know, a <clears throat> sudden onset here of a Morgagni hernia in this older guy, this middle-aged guy. So when something pops up that rapidly, that's not what I was expecting. You know, I was worried that this is going to be some sort of tumor. So here's a, a woman who um, has this very well circumscribed anterior cardiophrenic angle mass. It's quite large and contains bowel pretty clearly. And this is another Morgagni hernia, really a giant one here with tons of colon, not just not just omentum. And once again, it's the coronal that is the most helpful projection in all this because it shows, usually shows the break and the vessels streaming through. So in the old days before we had coronal and sagittal reconstruction, we just had cross-sectional imaging. You had to look pretty hard to see these vessels streaming through the gap in the diaphragm to identify what looked often like mediastinal fat as really being displaced abdominal fat coming through a defect. So you had to piece together this streaming of the vessels through, but it's really nice with coronals to see it right off. So here's a huge Morgagni hernia containing lots of colon. So those are sort of bread and butter cases, but cute. And then um, here's a person who has this uh, lowish lung volume and this subtle interstitial uh, abnormality at the lung bases here. You can see it looks like very fine reticulation down there. This is the sort of thing you might see with scleroderma and very fine lung fibrosis is very fine fibrosis. It's hard to actually appreciate as fibrosis. And often the, the only manifestation in this early lung fibrosis and scleroderma is low lung volume. So it has significant restriction. You may not see very much whiteness in the lung bases. So this person got a CT scan and um, there's a extensive ground glass abnormality. It's concentrated in the bases. Um, it has some bubbliness to it, and this is a chronic non-smoker. This person has never smoked, um, but it's got all these bubbles in it, and it's got some patches of sparing and stuff like that. So it's kind of, it's a lot of ground glass. It's basal predominant. It maybe has some cysts in it or some spared areas or both. And so when you see cysts in conjunction with basal ground glass, you start to think about uh, the possibility of DIP, but 
there was some esophageal dilation. There was, you know, it was a question about the diagnosis here of scleroderma in this person. It's not really solid, but it's thought this person might have scleroderma. So the lung biopsy returned DIP. And it turns out there are some case reports of DIP occurring in scleroderma. So there are DIP cases that are not related to cigarette smoking, but this is the first time I've ever seen that come up. So they they call this DIP, they're very, very confident diagnosis of DIP on the um, on the lung biopsy. So I wonder if you guys have if anybody else has seen DIP in in context other than cigarette smoking. This person is a life lifelong non-smoker. So David, it's described in the literature as occurring in patients with connective tissue disease, but and I, I'll have to ask our pathologist, but I wonder if it's because I mean the DIP we think is smoking, those are smokers macrophages that have a very particular look to them and a very particular color, which I can't tell from any other color. But um, I wonder if they are macrophages, but they're filled with something else. And it's okay. Because a lot of times, because like in some of the early literature of DIP, they talk about uh, fibrosis in the alveolar walls, which a pathologist would probably call, said looks like NSIP. Right. So, um, yeah, That's I've never I seen, so I I always think of it as pure DIP, which is really just along the spectrum of smoking, and then sort of this mixed pattern of whatever cells, whatever these are in these macrophages with a CT that looks more like connective tissue disease. Um, yeah. I don't know if Travis has. So maybe there's something about connective tissue disease that promotes accumulation of macrophages. I, that um, I don't know, unless there's um, with the with the it's just they're mopping up any damage that the immune auto the immune response does to the lung. Right. So I mean, I expected you know, given the context, that this was that they would refer to a diagnosis of an NSIP pattern here with, you know, really. A ground glass abnormality like this on CT, basal predominant esophageal dilation. This should should be NSIP. So, um, yeah, I think I think you're right, Jeff. There are more. That, there's probably more than one reason to get macrophages that stick around and don't get cleared normally. Don't don't turn over normally. Okay, so let me show you this uh, this man who is I think in his 40s. At this point, and uh, he uh, at, at, he was in the military, applied to the military. He had no exercise limitations at this time when he was, I think, around 20. But he was told he had a small right lung, and then his mother told him that he had a small right lung ever since he was born. So this is nothing new. This very small right lung with the mediastinum shifted to the right, and a pretty grungy look to that uh, to that lung base. So you start to think about, could this be a congenital thing like uh, hypoplastic pulmonary artery on that side, absence of the uh, right pulmonary artery. So we'll scan through him and we'll see that the striking finding here is, he does have a pulmonary artery. The right pulmonary artery seems awfully bright compared to the main and left pulmonary artery. And we're at the levo phase of the contrast. There's a lot of contrast on the left here and the lots of, um, probably systemic arteries that are involved here. This is a small right lung. The, the small right pulmonary artery does make it out into the lungs, so it's not the usual interrupted pulmonary artery. And the striking vascular abnormality is that there is no pulmonary vein on the right. So I think that this is a case of uh, unilateral pulmonary vein, vein atresia here, and the small right pulmonary artery reflects the reduced venous return from this lung. And all with all the systemic arterialization here going on, I think that some blood is being forced backwards into this right pulmonary artery. And that's why this is so very bright here in conjunction with these very bright systemic arteries nearby. So I think the anomaly here is really a venous abnormality. So absence of pulmonary veins on that side. I think somebody else showed a case of this. There was some discussion about this disorder a few a few months ago, but this is the first time I've ever seen it here. Uh, weren't, weren't some cases presented a few months ago of this uh, anomaly, a primary yeah. 
rather than arterial anomaly. Did Peter show one? I, I so, vaguely remember one, but, and David, I would have lost a lot of money on that radiograph saying it was proximal interruption of the pulmonary artery. Yeah. <laughs> so I found a couple of case reports that I glanced at this morning. I didn't read them in detail. And what struck me was uh, that they looked like this case in that there was a smallish but present pulmonary artery on that side. Mm -hmm. So the artery was small, but it was there. It wasn't, as you said, wasn't interrupted, wasn't gone. Um, so I think that's what helps distinguish it here. And then when you realize that you're not seeing any pulmonary veins on that side, I think that's uh, the way this case comes together. And it, there's a, you know, in these cases where there's systemic arterialization, you often have a lots of septal lines. Um, so, and I think that that fits here as well. So, so I think this reflects the systemic arterialization to get lots of septal lines. Okay, guys, um, that's what I wanted to show. Thank you. Cool. So, David, I found a, a little section on DIP in my uh, Palm Path book. Let me sh let me show that real quickly. Um, we can continue this discussion because it's interesting. All right. So this is from Dale and Hammer, which is sort of like the Palm Path book, and it's 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 a little bit older now, but and some of it's from the literature, but. What's interesting is you look at this uh, histopathologic features of DIP. So large numbers of macrophages in the alveoli, diff diffuse distribution. So we all know that. Um, and they talk about the, the, this, this, this finely granular light brown pigment. What I found interesting is stains variably for fine granular hemosiderin. So making me wonder if maybe smoking macrophages and this is slightly different. Um, and then they talk about a lot of lymphoid follicles that are, I like the double negative here, not infrequently present. And then... Um, some other inflammatory stuff going on here. So, and and then later on in the um, chapter, and here's some histopath images of 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 this, all these cells just fill, kind of filling the lung. And I kind of think along a continuum uh, with with RB and R uh, the RB, which of course is what the ATS put in their most recent document, which I think is newer than this 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 book chapter, but it's still I think this was published within the last ten years. Um, but I like this here too that. 90% were smokers, but that means there's a small number that occurred in non-smokers, whereas RBILD is, occurs exclusively in smokers. So they talk about with DIP dust, drug reactions, and inborn errors of metabolisms, and then a small group of patients who are never smokers and have no evidence of any other cause. So makes you wonder if this is just a, a tissue reaction, but I have seen it in connective tissue diseases, even though I don't see it in their chapter here, but I know I've seen biopsies at some point that had some DIP, and they often use the term DIP-like reaction, like they right. do. Yeah, and our, our, our resident looked up some cases and did find uh, case reports of DIP histology in people who had scleroderma, so that goes along with your notion of autoimmune disease being a, a, a situation in which you can see a DIP-like reaction. Mm -hmm. So, by the way, Dale and Hammer were both uh, Seattle uh, radiologists, and uh, Hammer is was the the famous local um, pulmonary radiologist for 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 many years. Dale stayed at um, at Virginia Mason, and then Hammer went off into a, a clinic and specialized really in asbestos diseases um, near the naval shipyards in the Seattle area here. So. He really devoted himself to asbestos in the last couple of decades of his life, and he died about uh, two years ago. Oh, interesting. I, you, I guess, I just, you mean pathologist? I illustrations to this book. So there's some credits for Godwin Pictures somewhere in this book. <laughs> <laughs> I used to work with Carol Farver at the Cleveland Clinic. She's one of the editors of this edition. So anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a great read. I've learned a lot from reading through it. I'll show some three quick cases, and Travis, unless you need to go early or anything. No, go ahead. I've got a couple. I'm glad you and Brian are here because okay. you can enlighten me on some of this stuff. Um, so this was a, an older patient uh, who presented to D short of breath and uh, looking for PE, and we had an interesting incidental finding, um, and that is this stuff here around the ascending aorta, and then this guy which seems to be coming off the right coronary artery. 
you can see there's a stent right there, and then the, the distal right coronary artery is quite dilated. So, um, and he's had a, a, a mitral valve, and uh, he's got a pacer, and he's got a bunch of lung stuff going on. That's probably the the cause of his, his acute issues. But so this is like an unexpected pseudo aneurysm of his right coronary artery, and um, uh, that's something I've seen very often. And clearly, this one's been there for some time. Um, and in following up with cardiology, they weren't going to really do anything about it. The cardiologist who saw him made a comment that the, I guess that there's the, there's not any real consensus on what to do with these. And I think with his comorbidities, no one really wants to do much else. But have you guys come across these before? And if so, is it is it just you think related to the PCI, or is it due to the atherosclerosis, or is this is this sort of a contained like like a penetrating ulcer type, or whatever you want to call it, a contained rupture type picture? What was the median sternotomy for? Did he have Is bypass as well, valve? or did oh mitral valve? Yeah, uh, yeah. Because obviously we typically see that if if they've had an aortic surgery at an anastomosis, like of a coronary button. Right. I don't think I've seen that before with a with a PCI like that, like a, a pseudo aneurysm like that. I think we've seen hemopericardium. Right. from PCI before, but that's impressive. Yeah, and it's right where the stent is. So I'm presuming that's what it's from, and it's probably been there for some time. Because his cardiac history was, I mean, that, that PCI was quite a while ago. Now, Brian, have you ever come across one of these, or David? I haven't seen it, but I, I, I've seen it described in the literature um, mm -hmm. as an iatrogenic lab. Okay. I think I would observe it and maybe follow it up and see if it's enlarging. But it, yeah, I think that having the prior median sternotomy helps with the adhesions. Right, and no one's keen to really go muck around in there. Okay, um, this case is kind of cool, and I'll be curious what you think. So this is a young woman who has the pretty classic delta of 508 mutation, CF, cystic fibrosis, and I I see a fair amount of CF, but I I haven't I don't recall seeing a case that had this much small airway disease. So she's got some upper lobe bronchiectasis, not as bad as we often see, but uh, she has tree and bud pretty much everywhere. Some air trapping distally. And I had an old scan and it looked exactly like this. It hadn't changed. So this is not an acute infection and she's just um, her usual state. So I don't know, have you guys ever seen CF with this extensive bronchiolitis and relatively milder bronchiectasis? Well, no. I think with the, if you subtract out the bronchiectasis, I think David would say the same thing. This is, this looks like excipient lung. Uh -huh. She probably has an indwelling catheter. So is, does she have, does she have pulmonary hypertension, Jeff? It looks uh, like it. Her, her pulmonary artery is large, which on its own isn't that big of a deal with CF, but what right. about her, her RV? Um, it doesn't look look very big. There's her septum there. I mean, no, and does she have a catheter? Long, I would think, yeah, I, I mean, maybe I could not find anything that explained it. Um, but I, I, I think it's actually her airways just because um, her, I mean, she's pretty obstructed. Jeff does. She does uh, have a catheter. She does. I saw it when he was scrolling through. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's there. I, I, that's what I thought because I remember when you've shown cases, Travis, and you've always said when you see tree and bud in every lobe of every, you know, every yeah. segment and every lobe, you really got to think about that because we don't see bron infectious bronchiolitis do that. But this is just a, uh, this is just yeah. a pick. I think it was in short term. It's not a tunnel catheter. I, long term. So, <clears throat> Jeff, is she does she get antibiotic treatment? Um, is she getting regular, regular stuff to control pseudomonas and stuff? This is probably pseudomonas. Yeah, I mean she's got um, typical uh, stuff. I couldn't. I, I mean, she had the pick in for for antibiotics, so I'm presuming she had a flare. I, I the other thing is I don't know. I'm I'm going to perseverate on the arterial disease here because the the bronchioles are not at all thick. You know the airways that are involved in the upper lobes are are destroyed, but like They're not some big. of those areas, you don't see. You know the there's just no wall thickening of a lot of those airways in areas that are affected. Mm. 
the the thing about excipient lung to me is it's usually not this uniform. It's usually basal predominant. This goes all the way up to the apices. And um, it's the prettiest you know, treatment bud you'll ever see, though. Yes, no, we, it's, we definitely have. Yeah, David, I definitely have excipient lung cases involving the apices too. Like really? every, I mean, but this, like, look at that MIP. Yeah, it's gorgeous. I still I think, know, I think it's, I mean, we've got we've got an airways disease here to start with, so we really have to uh, throw out Occam's razor to say, okay, uh, and you know it, it's legit because patients don't always follow Occam's um, you know rules about this. So, and there's there is mosaic attenuation here, which looks more like um, airways disease than mm -hmm. it does like pulmonary hypertension kind of mosaic. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, my first guess in the setting of cystic fibrosis is that this is just a, this is a case with lots of small airways disease, but to see some small airways disease in cystic fibrosis is very common. Just, right. This is, this is a large amount. So, um, you know, almost all cystics get pseudomonas and staphylococcus eventually. So, you know, if you found this in, a, in another person, you'd say this person's colonized with pseudomonas. Now, you know, I really, I really think that it's probably airways disease, but I, Travis, I can't, I can't say it's not excipient. I've just never seen it this uniform and this extensive all the way to the apex like that. With, with Jeff's comment that this is unchanged, the pseudomonas, certainly staph would, would fluctuate. Pseudomonas, I've never, have you seen it colonized where it just, yes, it never yeah. changed over? Oh. Um, you know, it, it waxes and wanes. I, I, I'd be very interested in what the bacteriology on her sputum is, Jeff. So right, well, I will look it up. Uh, maybe, dig around later. Maybe it's a or something like that. Because there are other wow. bugs in there that can do it. But, you know, these are all good points. Yeah, I mean, as far as I know, um, yeah, there wasn't anything. But if, uh, if I'll, I'll see if I can find anything in her history. Um, a lot of times uh, she's in her young 20s, so a lot of times when they transfer to the adult CF clinic, we don't. If they come from outside our system, we don't always have all the detail. But I mean, she had a pick in, so presumably she was getting some antibiotics. Then I presume you're going to tell us that she's uh, she has a Korean father and a Japanese mother. <laughs> it's no, she's Wisconsin native, for what I know. All right. Um, Last case here. Now, Travis, you got to see this one earlier. David, you're going to love this. And Brian, you're going to love this case. Um, this is the uh, something I was not expecting. So this is a, um, a call from a pulmonologist who got a call from a pulmonologist about what is it? What do we do with it? So this is a guy, uh, older guy with bad pulmonary hypertension. I don't know how bad his pressures are, um, but longstanding um, and no, I, from what I could tell, this wasn't expected. It wasn't an acute finding. I think they were more worried about his, his, um, his, his oxygenation, not any chest pain. And so um, you can see he's got a massive pulmonary artery. He's got huge branch pulmonary arteries. And then he's got this, this little flap of tissue just kind of scrolling across. And I'll put up a coronal. Um, because the person who called me was wondering if it was real, if it was an artifact. And after looking at it, you can see it's, it is no question that that's a real little band of tissue there. So um, this is a pulmonary artery dissection. And they're really, really rare. And uh, Seth said he'd seen one in the CTEF patient. And there, he sent, there's a couple papers, a case reports, the literature, and they kind of look just like this. It's, it, to me, it's a little thick and kind of not your... I don't know. I wondered if it had been there for some time and it was sort of instantly picked up, but um, they can be fatal according to one case report, whatever that's worth. But um, this is the only one I've ever seen in the wild. And I suspect it'll probably be the only one I ever do. Um, have you ever seen one? Anyone else? No, no. that's amazing. Yeah, no, there was there was one case at, at Wash U before I was a resident and I think it was a Marfan's patient, but I've never seen one. In the no, wild. I say, this this pulmonary artery looks too big too oh it's huge yeah and he's got bad ph there's yeah. nothing new and i wonder oh, okay if, and he but it's, he's older he's i think in his 70s so it's not he's not marfanoid he's not he doesn't have any no connective tissue disorder um what is the hypertension jeff what's uh, unknown idiopathic but you can see i mean his rv is it's it's 
not very happy. He's got chronic you know, atherosclerosis. I don't see, there's a little bit of calcium right there. So I wonder, I mean, he's probably had long-standing pH. I wonder if that's some early atherosclerosis. Because I remember you talking about that a lot, David. Is, Yeah, I mean, look at right. So yeah, he's probably he's got had it. large high pressures for whatever period of time. Mm -hmm. you know, it could have been if someone did a right heart cath and it's iatrogenic and maybe they didn't notice it at the time and it's just been chronic since. That's one possibility. Um, well, you know, Jeff, the, the main risk factor for aortic dissection is hypertension and he's got pulmonary hypertension. So he's entitled to yeah. develop, you know, dissection. Um, he doesn't yeah. have a very healthy looking aorta. So his, his, um, his pulmonary hypertension probably came late in his life mm -hmm. at the time when he already enlarged his aorta with systemic hypertension. And, um, uh, then he got pulmonary hypertension as well. But, um, you know, if, if he'd had pulmonary hypertension from a young age, he would not have any, he would not have aortic enlargement because he, he wouldn't have that much forward output. Mm -hmm. So his pulmonary hypertension came late in life when he'd already destroyed his aorta. Okay. All right. Well, those are my cases. Um, Amazing. Awesome. All right, Travis. Okay. There you go. Well, since I mentioned this, I'll show it first. Uh, this is the one I just got an email about this morning. So I, I think Brian, we had mentioned somebody had shown one last week, and then I mentioned we had had a positive case here, but this was from. University of Oregon, and they had seven cases. They were all adolescents. The interesting thing was too, they were all male. Uh, six of the seven, you can see, had no prior infections, cardiac MR, and all of them. And then they all fortunately recovered though. Uh, that's the one. And then um, to the other thing I mentioned, this was a, a paper in, it was Circulation, not Jack. Uh, just, they had looked at, I think, 19,000 athletes and found an exceedingly low rate of any sort of hospitalization. So especially in, in patients with like uh, low severity of disease, they thought there was low risk and low prevalence. Uh, but that if people want to, to turn to those. And then uh, David, I pulled this one up quickly. This is an old, this is probably an old famous case from, from UCSF. This was one, this is a weightlifter, and this is one where you can see these are the old step and shoot HRCT. This patient actually had had a surgical lung biopsy. This was like 2005, um, but this was excipient lung and a weightlifter that involves really from from top to bottom every lobule. In this case, um, so certainly does happen like that. And then we'll start with this. This case is a perfect companion for the one that David showed. Um, Brett Elliker picked this up on the radiograph and it's a nice pickup. This is a patient who was having rib pain or what they thought was rib pain. So that you can see on this rib series they did at the time of the chest radiograph, I'll pull these up side by side. That they have a radiopaque DV here over the right anterior chest. And he noticed this finding, which is a very good observation. And here on the PA view as well. And it, it pans out on a couple of the other rib views. Thought it was maybe right in here. Uh, but something vague, and there was no lateral, but the rib pain was anterior and thought maybe this was something anteriorly located. And they went to CT. And so this is when I got involved. But the CT, as you'll see, what that corresponds to was, you know, a little bit of fat, a little bit of inflammation, and some adjacent atelectasis to it. And so this looked like mediastinal fat necrosis at the time. Now, I wasn't sure. We were, and I'm a little remiss now that we question whether there could be a little bit of a Morgagni hernia here as well. Uh, but you'll see that uh, this just came to my attention again when they got follow up. This was six months ago. So they, the clinician got a six month follow up and they were more fixated on the presence of the Morgagni hernia causing the symptoms rather than the just mediastinal fat necrosis. And as you'll see, this resolved. And I don't actually think that there's a, a Morgagni hernia there, but it, looking at their notes, they really, weren't paying attention to the this whole mediastinal fat necrosis. They were fixated on the Morgagni hernia, but I think this is just, it just happens to be a little bit more anterior, the, the mediastinal fat necrosis, which has since resolved. And no Morgagni hernia that I see here on the, on the uh, sagittal view. 
Yes, a coronal. But, yeah. Actually, I'll show you a coronal, the old one. Because it kind of like is right next to the diaphragm, but I don't see a defect in that diaphragm. Do you? It gets very attenuated there when you go way anterior. Yeah. So medially, it's very attenuated. Um, this is the follow-up study. Let's let, let's look at coronal on that one. Yeah, I think it must have just been the inflammatory strain. Yeah. Let me not let me unsync these. It looks as if there it's it is. Yeah, because we had kind of questioned that, and then yeah, it looks like it's intact. So I think this is just run-of-the-mill mediastinal fat necrosis. Right. Cool. But visible on a radiograph, which is pretty unusual. So that is impressive. This is not a subtle case, and I show it for just shock and awe factor. Well, one more thing so about that last that. case, Travis, yeah. is that morganium hernias, morganium hernias usually don't cause pain. So I think the pain goes with the fat necrosis diagnosis, too. Yeah. I mean, the, the whole presentation. Right. Unless they have incarcerated bowel right. or something, which I don't. Have you ever seen incarceration through a morgagni hernia? I don't think I have actually. Now that I, I think of it, no. I, I just show this. You can see the heart, the pulmonary, probably some pulmonary artery enlargement. It's hard to say, but this is all left atrium. But I show this because this is a lady with a history of rheumatic heart disease, and she came in for transcatheter mitral valve planning. And um, I think this wins as the largest left atrium that I've ever seen. It almost looks like the United States. You've got the Northeast here. You've got a little bit of Florida down here. But uh, I just show it because I don't know what they're going to do with this. And I'm just, I'm blown away that this lady, you know, presented at this point in time um, looks with this degree of left atrial enlargement. Travis, it looks as if it's border forming on the left. It's actually border forming yeah. out there. So, yeah, uh, it was the left atrial appendage. Border on the forming on scale. both sides. Yeah, that is, yeah. Uh, that's a grande on the Starbucks scale. <laughs> well, and I think it's, I wanted to ask you what you thought. I think it's actually causing air trapping or mosaic attenuation in the lower lobes, particularly on the right. And you can see how squished these airways are. are. I think this is actually probably the reason she has some mosaic attenuation as well. Yeah, on both yeah, sides, but, like the lower lobes are, first of all, they're yeah. small and yeah, they're just being squashed. Yeah. So, and that, I think this is a hamartoma. It looked fatty just as a bonus. But yeah, I've never seen a left atrium this large and it was reportedly from rheumatic heart disease because she does have a little bit of aortic stenosis and some pulmonic valve as well, or not pulmonic. Um, I think it's just the left-sided valves. Look at the smoke, uh, the the white smoke coming in the left atrium from the left inferior vein. Actually, all the veins, but the left inferior vein. Yeah, just all that heterogeneous flow. Yeah, so that was one I saw from across the room, and I asked the fellows, like, what on earth are we looking at here? It took a while to figure it out. Now, this one, I'll show you the radiographs, because I, I saw this at the end, uh, but curious. These radiographs are done 12 days apart, and the patient did have a procedure in between. And I'm curious if there's anything you would, you guys would see, call on this one. Obviously biased, knowing that there's probably a subtle finding. Otherwise, I wouldn't be showing it here. Did they drain a pericardial effusion? What was that, David? Did they drain a pericardial effusion? No, but I will tell you they did a bronchoscopy in between. Like this was actually done immediately after the bronchoscopy, evaluate for pneumothorax. And the one 12 days later was when he came back in symptomatic. Okay, well, I mystified. Yeah, I think the only thing, knowing in retrospect, if you look at the left main stem bronchus, you can see it looks a little bit narrower and maybe a little bit more horizontal uh, but did, wait till you see the ct here did they drain a, uh, a bronchogenic cyst no they did a subcarinal lymph node biopsy and so they 
did a non-contrast CT first and one of my colleagues correctly said, this looks high attenuation, knowing that they had done a biopsy, said maybe there's a hematoma here, get contrast. And I've never seen active extravasation into a node before. And this was from a bronchial artery. So Ooh. this is iatrogenesis here with a, with a hematoma and, and in a subcarinal lymph node post biopsy. Wow. And um, you know, I wish I had the 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 angio images. I don't. They tried to go in and embolize this, but they actually inadvertently dissected the bronchial artery. But that actually obtained stasis, so they didn't do anything further. So they, uh, you know, were able to to knock it off, you know, successfully. And this was the follow up. This is just from a few days ago, and you can see that it has shrunk since then. Uh, but I think that. You, know, you can see the mass effect on that bronchus, so you know, not that it would be expected to to make that call. But I think you can, you know, retrospectively, I can reconstruct that. It's kind of interesting if you do a, a mean here. So I, yeah, I've never seen that type of. Um, what was the cause of the lymphadenopathy? Complications wrong. See. So Travis, uh, you broke up by down. Uh, what was the cause of the lymphadenopathy? thing? Say that again. I missed it. What what was the cause of the lymph node enlargement? I, that's a good question. It was your your sound is intermittent, Travis. It turned out to be not uh, there there was no malignancy. I think that was there was some question about whether he had cancer or not, because the 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 subcranial node in particular was a little larger, but you can see some of these are a little bit higher attenuation. There's prior tuberculosis in the left upper lobe. And I think yeah. the final path was just anthracotic. And I, I don't remember, this was an incidentaloma to start with. Got it. So, all right, Jeff, that's it for me. All right, thank you. So David, I did a little digging. Um, my patient with cystic fibrosis, um, no history of any substance abuse, doesn't drink smoke or anything like that. Um, but did have a history of, of staph and, pneumo and um, pseudomonas in the past. Um, and, and this scan was done because of a, a CF exacerbation. But it seems to be that that's her chronic airways disease. Uh, um, she's, she's only 60% of predict, uh, predicted uh, PFTs for um, FEV1 and FEC. Mm -hmm. I think those are probably little inspissated uh, mucus plugs then in yeah. the bronchial level. It's, yeah, I just have not seen that with CF, and I mean, I've seen it as a finding as part of it, but never as the dominant pattern. That's why I was curious if anyone else had seen it. But you know, I've seen it, Jeff. I've seen it uh, in people who get with CF who get admitted and get intubated, uh, and then their lungs will fill up with those little plugs because when they're intubated, they can't cough effectively and they can't remove them. So I've seen those things develop mm -hmm. and really, you know, flourish on serial CTs if somebody is intubated and is not coughing properly. Crazy. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. Great cases and discussion. And uh, I'll talk to you all next week. Jeff, I'll be, I'll be on a plane this time next week to a one-way ticket to Durham. So I'll all see right. you guys the week after. You'll have to catch up with us when you get settled. Happy uh, all right. Thanks. Take Bye. care, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.